Hello everybody and welcome. I'm glad everybody could make it. Um, just barely squeaking in under the wire on getting an August live stream done. I've been busy, I've been sick, uh, so I'm trying to get back into the groove doing live streams and getting videos made and all that. So I um, appreciate you coming out <clears throat> and hanging out with me on this Sunday afternoon. Uh, so it's, it's mainly, our subject today is, is Q&A, pottery Q&A. So if you have a question, Put it in the comments and I will try to get to all of those in the course of this live stream. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to touch on. Oh, also let me know if the audio uh, volume is good, if you're hearing me okay, or if there's a problem and you know I can adjust. Um, a few things, announcements or, or reminders that I wanted to touch on. Um, workshops. Um, my October workshop is full. Um, I have a November mug workshop. That's a shorter three-day workshop that's taught here in Tucson. There's currently, I think, six openings in that workshop if you're interested. And the location for that is on my website, which is on the screen. Okay. Um, the Kiln Conference. Uh, the Southwest Kiln Conference is coming up. That's a great place for people who are interested in learning about primitive pottery, pottery replication, these kind of subjects, to learn more, talk to people that are experts in the field. Uh, because a lot of people that know a lot of things are all going to come together and fire pottery together. And so this year it's being taught at or it's being taught, it's being put on at the edge of Cedar State Park in Blanding, Utah. Uh, I think it's September 29th through October 1st. So right there, that last weekend in September, 1st of October, um, it'll be like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Friday, there'll be lectures. Uh, Saturday, there'll be uh, firings. And then Sunday, we open the kilns and then everybody goes home. So it's a great opportunity to learn. Uh, and the edge of Cedar State Park is a wonderful museum. Lots and lots of antique, you know, ancient pottery to look at. So. Uh, it's a great opportunity. I appreciate, or I, I recommend any of you, if you can, to make uh, time to go uh, do the Southwest Kiln Conference. Uh, I'm not seeing any comments about my audio. Is it okay? Audio's fine. Okay, thanks, Don. Um, uh, so my, I'll tell you what I've been working on uh, since in the last couple of months. Excuse me while I get a drink. Um, I'm working on, I'm putting out a video next Sunday, and so I'm working on that project, and that involves this little mug. Here. So here's a mug I've made, and I painted it with some white clay, so it's it's a little different look, but um, it's almost done. I've got a little bit of polishing to do, and then I need to let it dry and, and fire it. So that's a video, that's for the next video that I'm working on. Um, the sheet pot. So the challenge, I've been doing these monthly uh, ancient pottery challenges. Uh, I post them on Instagram and Facebook usually. And this month, for August, is the Sheep Effigy Pot, which is uh, a difficult one. Let me show you what the um, the ancient pot looks like. Uh, that's not it. There it is. So that is a pot that is at the edge of Cedars State Park that I was talking about where we're going to have the Kiln Conference next month. And that's a really amazing pot. And I don't know, archaeologists say it's a bighorn sheep. You know, it looks like a wiener dog. <laughs> But anyways, this is the challenge for, for August. So a lot of people are working on uh, making one of these. And this is mine. I'm, I'm just unwrapping it. I have it in three bags to keep it from, from drying out. Uh, so I'll show you where I'm at on this. Whew, I don't want to break off anything. Okay, so it's got, it's got four legs. Oh, let me, um, let me, let me change the view so you, can, uh, so you can see it better. Four legs and a tail, got a little handle a nose, a couple of horns. You can see if you look at the, um, if you look at the original, um, there was something broken off on the side of the head, and I don't know if it was horns or ears. So, you know, I just kind of made that part up, uh, the, the horns I added there, because the archaeologist said it was a sheep. Although, like I said, it, it looks a little more dog than sheep-like to me. So that's where I'm at with that. And if you're making, um, if you're participating in the uh, ancient pottery uh, August challenge, then. Um, Upload your finished pot uh, to Instagram with the hashtag Ancient Pottery August, and uh, and then I'll share it with everybody. So that's that. And, and I missed a week because I was sick, so uh, I'm a little behind what I should be. So Wednesday I'll be slipping that, and then um, I'll paint it. Uh, I've been doing it in the Ancient Potters Club, so I, I do it on uh, our Wednesday night Zoom pottery class. Uh, what else have I been doing? Organic paint. Um, so I'm doing an experiment with organic paint. Um, this one, and it should have been fired already, except, like I said, I've been sick. So, um, This one is painted with four different uh, smectite clays. I'm testing different ones, and I'm going to 
I'm going to fire this in a different way too, a, a test firing. And so it's got um, uh, the stuff I get from the little Colorado. It's got the stuff from a uh, Blanding, Utah. It's got some stuff from St. John's, Utah, and it's got that cannonball uh, slip from Colorado. And then it's painted. The paint is uh, mesquite bean paint. So uh, I'm doing some experiments with organic paint. The other thing I'm doing is I'm getting ready to harvest a bunch of materials for organic paint. So tomorrow, if I if I feel up to it, I'm going to go out early. It's It's been so hot. Um, it's not usually this hot in August here. But I, I need to go out and collect some materials to make organic paint. So I don't... A little bit of organic paint goes a long way. You can have a small amount and you can paint many, many pots with it. Um, but I sell it on my website. So I have to make a lot of organic paint in the course of a year. And so tomorrow I'm going to go out and collect a bunch of different materials that are... Or it's the time of year to get. Uh, so last week I was out, I got some mesquite beans. That's good because that... That makes a good paint. That's the one I used on this pot here. And then um, tomorrow I'm going to get sunflowers. There's roadside sunflowers growing all over in southern Arizona right now. So I'm going to collect a big batch of uh, those roadside like wild sunflowers. And uh, the prickly pears are just going bananas right now. So I'm going to go collect a big bucket full of prickly pears, which is another thing you can make paint from. Uh, anything with a high sugar content will make a good paint. And prickly pears, of course, being a fruit, are full of sugar. And then there's, uh, there's yucca fruit out there too this year. I went out uh, about a week ago and I, I scouted around and there was a lot of yucca fruits out there, but they weren't ripe, they're really firm. So um, I'm gonna go tomorrow and, and I'm gonna see if they've ripened up a little bit. If they haven't, my question is, and maybe you can answer this in the comments if you know something about this. If I pick those yucca fruits and they're not quite ripe, like any fruit, can I just leave them sit around and they'll ripen up if I if I like put them in a bag together? You know, like you would tomatoes or, or apples or something, right? Will they ripen after I pick them or should I just wait and pick them later? So that's the question. Um, uh, gourd scrapers. Gourd scrapers, which I used to make my pots, have been off of my website. They've been unavailable for several weeks, maybe a month. Uh, and they've, they've just been back on the website today. So if you were... If you were looking for these on my website and they weren't available uh, because I was out, uh, you can go to the website now and order gourd scrapers. Um, so I, th I think that covers everything that I needed to touch on. Okay, I'm going to hit these uh, questions and I'll, I'll go through a bunch of the questions and then uh, I'll come back and um, I'll recap and then we'll go back to the questions and we'll try to get through all your questions if I can. How many people we got in here today? Uh, 36. Okay, um, starting at the top, you know what this uh, software I use for streaming does? It, it, it hides the top comment if I pin a comment. So the top one, I can't see who asked the question, but he was asking about um, native pottery traditions in the northeast. I think he's up in northeastern Canada, you know, like New Brunswick or something, if I remember right. And um, I, don't, I don't know much about, you know, the native pottery traditions up in that country. I know on the east coast of the United States, you know, like New England and stuff, that there there is pottery, but I don't know very much about it. Um, I just know they had it, so um, I, I really can't direct you to anything. The best thing you can do is, you know, check out your local museums, talk to your local archaeologists, because um, they did have pottery over there. There are places in North America where the natives never made pottery. Um, uh, Washington and Oregon, like western, uh, the North the Pacific Northwest, uh, they just never used pottery. So um, it's possible that, you know, there's some places that are like that on the East Coast as well. But overall, you can go all over North America and there's pottery traditions. Um, I was recently made aware of some really beautiful pottery coming out of Florida. Um, really, really ancient, way older than any pottery in the Southwest where I live. So uh, if you dig into it, I'm sure you'll find some stuff to inspire you, no doubt. Uh, Joshua Wagner says, uh, Nevada, I was hoping I could quickly touch with on the function of, excuse me, bowls with intricate designs painted on the inside, were they used? Uh, was there not a fear of rubbing away the paint? Yeah, um, archaeologists uh, often will do what they call use wear analysis on these on these bowls. So they will actually look at, at where the the wear is on the bowl because they're earthenware. They you know they show wear fairly easy because it's a fairly soft ceramic material. And they can tell if these bowls were used. In fact, it's believed that a lot of those bowls, especially those, you know, this size decorated bowls, were often just like a personal eating bowl. Like you'd eat your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner out of the same bowl every day. And so, yeah, they were using them. And a lot of times in those old bowls, I've got one ancient bowl up here in my collection that uh, I have. And 
uh, you can see the design is partially worn off on the inside from whatever they were doing in it, cooking or eating or whatever. They, they've worn off some of the slip on the inside and with it, the paint. So yeah, um, they really were using those bowls. I don't think, you, there are ceremonial you know, functions for some pottery, but most of those painted bowls were actually used. And those big ones, some of those, some of those painted bowls uh, that you see pictures of, if you see a picture on the internet, it's hard to get an idea of the size. But some of those are really, really big. Um, and like I just made a St. John's polychrome bowl in our our ancient pottery challenge for last month, for July, was the St. John's polychrome. And a lot of people participated. And um, I don't I don't think I ever, if I put those online, I'll have to check. I don't remember. I've been sick. So, uh, Anyways, there's a bunch of, of really big St. John's bowls, and they're beautiful. They're painted with black on the inside. They're painted with white on the outside, and they're slipped red. Um, and they're just really nice. And they believe those were, um, those big ones were for feasting. So in the, in Pueblo culture, Pueblo, Native American Pueblo culture, Pueblo Indian culture, um, they have a lot of feasts. And when they have these feasts, part of it is feeding not only their family, but everybody in the village or, or the guests that come. And so and that's, that's part of the tradition. And so they believe these big decorated bowls were for feasting rituals. So they'd have a big dance. People would maybe come from other villages. They'd make lots of food and they'd pass it around in these bowls. And, and that the decorations on the outside especially would indicate visually, like you could see them across the Pueblo, across the plaza, right? And you would know whose family had brought that dish. And so it would say, this is this is our dish kind of thing. So uh, there's some interesting studies on that. Uh, were written by an archaeologist named um, um Mills, um, Barbara Mills, and that's real interesting about the feasting rituals uh, as it relates to these old bowls. So yeah, they were very much used. Uh, Mark Gibson, looking forward to the lesson. My question is, do you have students or have you taught anyone how to make pottery and they became as skilled or more successful than yourself at it? Well, sure, absolutely. Um, I, I always say I'm, you know, I'm not a great, great potter. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not putting myself down, but I'm not, I'm not a super excellent potter. I'm a good potter, um, but it's easy to to surpass me in in quality if you wanted to. Um, you know, I have a real I have a real um, passion for for the ancient pottery, and that's kind of different, right? I mean, I don't know if anybody surpassed me in in passion or or maybe all the different bits of information I've collected over the years because I'm always studying and reading and trying to you know absorb more information. But certainly in in quality, lots of students have surpassed me. In I mean, look look at Wes uh, Wes Pruitt um, Airstream Wanderings. I know a lot of you've probably seen his videos. He he's doing excellent work. Have you seen that? He just fired a um, a, a Segi Orangeware, you know, um, a Cayenta style um, a polychrome bowl uh, this week. That was just just beautiful. So yeah, lots of lots of students have surpassed me in ability in qualities. You know, I try to stay. My thing is um, I have a passion for it. And that I have um, a diverse kind of eclectic knowledge of the subject. I have lots of little bits of information from all over that I can kind of spout out, which makes me a good teacher. <clears throat> Quality of work. Uh, lots, of, lots of people have surpassed me, sure. Hey, I had a guy, uh, I taught a workshop a few years ago here in Tucson, and, and a, a Pueblo potter took my class, a well-known Pueblo potter. Um, I won't give his name because I don't know if he wants to be, you know, outed, but he, he came, he drove down from Santa Fe and and took my class just because he wanted to broaden his understanding of how his ancestors made pottery. Really nice guy. I mean, he sells pots for thousands and thousands of dollars all the time. He's well known, well respected native, uh, you know, Pueblo potter. He was already ahead of me before I even took my class. Uh, okay, Mariana Salazar. Hi, Andy. Mariana from Via de Leva, Colombia. Huge fan. Thanks, Mariana. I appreciate you. Showing up from Columbia, uh, Marble, Mar Mabel Soul, very good. Thanks, Mabel. Thanks for showing up, Mariana. I'd like to ask, how do you know the pots are warm enough to put them into the fire? Any additional tips to avoid breakage? I've heard adding talc to the clay helps with thermal shock. Have you used it? I have no experience with adding talc, um, but I imagine it would act just like any temper, any any non-plastic material, sand, volcanic ash, grog. Uh, uh, diatomaceous earth and talc would probably work exactly the same because it's really fine and it's non-plastic so it'd be the same as like volcanic ash or diatomaceous earth add it to the clay body <coughs> excuse me 
and it's going to help you uh, resist thermal shock. Absolutely. As to when to put it in the fire, it's not a matter of warmth. So when you're getting ready to fire, you you, you do something called preheating, right? Uh, and and so you're um, it's called preheating, and so it's easy to think uh, you're actually heating the pot. But the goal isn't with pre preheating isn't heating the pot up. It's getting rid of any excess moisture that's in it. Uh, so what you can do uh, is is actually uh, you could you can preheat those hours before you fire them. Maybe maybe even like twelve hours before you fire them. Put them in your oven at home. Run that oven up to about eh, two hundred degrees or something Fahrenheit. Let it sit there for an hour. You're good because what you're really doing is not so much heating the pot, but but driving out excess moisture. And then whenever you're ready, just go ahead and fire it. So it's not a matter of getting to a temp. It's a matter of running out that that moisture. And you can tell if it's moist uh, sometimes by touching it. You touch it to your face just because or your lips because they're more sensitive. Um, but if it's if it's a little bit cool to the touch, uh, then there's still moisture in it. Uh, if it's warm to the touch, then it's it's pretty dry. So the main point of preheating is just to drive the moisture out, not not actually to heat it up. So so saying preheating the pots can be a bit misleading because it makes you think, well, I'm going to run the temperature up a little bit, then I'm going to fire it, I'm going to run the temperature up more. You can put them in the fire cold as long as they're preheated and driven off that moisture because that's what's going to break them. <clears throat> uh, Matt Bates, hello, I'm from Alberta, Canada, and recently uh, your videos got me interested in pottery for a beginner. Would you suggest store-bought clay or wild clay? Yeah, if it's if it's easier for you to get started, uh, you know, buy Afra. Uh, Go ahead and use store bought clay. That's no, there's no shame in that. It's, in fact, that's a great way to do it. Especially if some people don't want to go out and hunt for clay. Some people, you know, have trouble finding clay where they live. They just don't want to go through the process. Um, other people, you know, I'm just wanting to get started. I don't want to fiddle with the clay. Now I want to make a pot. Go buy some clay. I did a video last year. Uh, I can't tell you the title right now, but you can go look for it and. It has to do with, I tested, I, I collected, I think, about five different commercial clays, and I tested them out, and then I fired them, you know, I, I built a bowl out of each, and I fired them in, a, in an outdoor fire. And I talk about how to use commercial clay and, and how to kind of get it through a fire like that. So it's fine. It works great, but you have to add temper to it. Most commercial clays are not going to be tempered enough. So take some sand or some grog or something and just knead it through that body really good uh, you know, like I say, about 20% would be fine. And then um, once it's got that grittiness to it, it's going to be more able to um, res resist the thermal shocks of, a, of an open firing. All right. Uh, Matt Bates, I got that. Don Art, woohoo, big fan. Looking forward to seeing you live. Started my ancient pottery technique journey a couple of weeks ago after seeing, I don't know, a dozen of your videos. I'm already made several pots. Good for you, Don. That's awesome. Question, what size of metal tub bucket do you use? I'm gathering this series uh, for my first firing. Okay, um, well, the bucket I use is based on the size of the pot or pots that I'm firing. So a lot of times, uh, if you saw that latest one where I did the double pot, if you saw that video, that's about three videos back, um, that, was a, that was an odd shaped pot because it was double, it was kind of long. So I actually went down, I measured the pot, you know, I got the, the width and the height. I went down to the hardware store and I and I looked around for something and I found that oblong um, bucket that was just perfect. Uh, and, and I measured it, made sure it was the right size. So you want something that's going to cover the pot and leave you at least an inch or two of, of space so you can get good air circulation around it. So just, uh, just do a measurement of what you have to fire and go down to the hardware store and see what you've got. If it's a little too big, that's better than being a little too small. Okay, it just it just has to have a little space around it. Uh, you qu question you mentioned in one of your videos that you use sunflowers and as additive to your paints to make them stick. Could you go into more detail about that? I'm growing sunflowers now. Yeah, uh, so just about all organic. Well, first of all, almost anything can be used as organic paint, plant wise. Uh, and the process for making it from all these things is pretty much the same. So I mentioned that I'm going out tomorrow. I'm going to collect sunflowers. Um, prickly pears, and yucca fruit. <clears throat> the process of all of those is going to be the same. Um, put it in a pot, boil it. Boil it for a long time until it's like a thick tea, a, a really strong tea. Uh, then um, let it cool because you can't stick your hand in it when it's boiling hot. Now, usually I let it cool overnight before I do the next step. Um, strain it out. 
use a, a really fine strainer, maybe like some cheesecloth or like those paint strainer bags that they sell at hardware stores and strain out all the solids uh, and then boil that tea down until it's it's thick, you know, tar-like, molasses-like. Uh, and so you do the same with sunflowers. The difference with fruit, <clears throat> excuse me, like yucca fruit or prickly pear is you'd have to chop that fruit up good first because you want that inside to kind of get in the water. Um, but with the with something like sunflower, you just have to chop it up small enough to get it in the pot and then cover it with water and boil it. So um, the, the process is the same. And I have a couple of decent videos about making organic paint. So um, <clears throat> Dawn Art, if you look at, it may not be sunflowers in the videos. It may be, you know, pr uh, mesquite beans or it may be... Um, uh, Rocky Mountain bee plant, but th it's all the same process. So just watch that video and do the same thing with the sunflowers. Question, is it necessary to polish pots with a rough stone first and then follow up with a polished stone? Does it depend on whether the pot has been slipped glazed? No. No, the process is the same whether the pot has been slipped or it's just the clay you formed it from. And I don't use different stones. I'll use the same stone for the entire process. I want a fairly smooth stone. I don't want to what is the word you used? Um, a rough stone. I never use a rough stone. They're fairly smooth. This one is not lapidary polished. This is from the beach. I do have some. Uh, yeah. So I do have some here uh, that are lapidary stones that have been tumbled, you know, mechanically. Um, they work the same. You, you'll polish it while it's still damp first, right? Just to kind of smooth it out. Like when you trowel concrete, you're just smoothing it out and kind of compressing the surface. It's the same process. Just over the pot while it's still quite damp. Then as it starts getting towards dry, then I'll start going over it, you know, and that's polishing. So one is more like stone smoothing and the other is more polishing. So I'll go over a pot during the course of the drying process and making it maybe three or four times to get a good polish. Um, so several different times, but the same stone. I'll, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a coarse stone and a smooth stone. <clears throat> And Don Art says, I will be taking your ancient pottery dot how classes beginning in September. Good. Good. That'll be good. Uh, J.D. Stewart is here. Jerry. Hey, Andy. I hope you're doing good. Yeah, I'm doing a lot better, Jerry. I appreciate that. Uh, Don Art. I've been playing around with my new digital thermometer testing pots in various stages of drying. The wetter ones read cooler. I wonder if you... Well, see, I've already talked about that, too. Um, like I said, as the pot is, is drying, you can feel it. You can feel that it's cooler when it's damp. And then this one's fully, this one's been made a month or so. It's warm and it's just warm and dry. So once it starts getting uh, dry, then it's warmer to the touch. And so that's true. I don't know about a set temperature because the temperature is going to vary based on the relative humidity. That coolness is just, um, what's the word for it? Evaporation. So when the pot has moisture in it, it's evaporating water all the time. So it's acting like uh, a swamp cooler, right? An evaporative cooler. And so it's making it colder. But it's going to evaporate more and lose more more moisture and, and actually gain cooler temperatures if the air, the surrounding air is drier. And so I don't think you can like zap it with your gun and look at the exact temperature and say, oh yeah, that's, that's dry or that's not dry. Because that's going to vary based on the relative humidity and, and how much moisture is in the pot and those kind of things. But certainly by, you know, just by seeing that difference between a cool and a warm pot will tell you if it's ready. Uh, and then, of course, you always have to preheat it as well before you fire it. <clears throat> uh, Angela's here. Uh, Andy knows all, sees all, and tells all. <laughs> well, I don't know, Angela, but I'll do my best. Thank you for that vote of confidence. Uh, Liam McWilliams, anyone from Ireland? I don't know, Liam. It's nice to have you here from Ireland, though. Uh, Tommy Seaton, Yatahe from Cayenta, Arizona, Navajo country, most notably for basket maker culture or ancestors to Anazazi people, our present-day Pueblo culture. Question, I grew up in the Segi Orangeware around. Oh, yeah, Segi Orangeware is beautiful. And I've made a little of that, but Wes over at Airstream Wanderings, that's his favorite. He's made a, quite a few of those uh, Segi Orangewares. <coughs> uh, and, and he asked a question, I think, lower down here. He's Tommy again. What organic paint was used besides bee plant? Um, uh, traditionally, I think in, in Pueblo culture... Uh, I think we only have, uh, as far as I know, you know, there's a lot of things Pueblo people don't even don't even tell people. And but what I know of is is bee plant and tansy mustard. Those are the two uh, that are traditional. But um, 
down here in southern Arizona, they had a lot of organic paint, you know, during the Salado time. So 1275 to 1400, something like that. And um, we don't know what they were using. They certainly weren't using, well, I doubt they were using bee plant. It doesn't grow here. Um, tansy mustard does grow here in the early spring. It's possible. But as I've shown, you can make organic paint from so many things. Like I said, mesquite beans, yucca fruit, prickly pears, uh, you know, sunflowers. So who knows? I, I know some archaeologists who are trying to determine what the paint was made from on Salado pottery. Southern Arizona made Salado pottery. And so they did analysis of the paint on the shards, the shards, to see if there was some, you know, chemical indicator that would tell them what plants were used. And all they could find was that it was carbon. So it wasn't very useful information, was it? <laughs> but maybe someday, uh, you know, science will advance and we'll be able to, to learn more about that. But as of now, I, I don't know. But yeah, organic paint can be made from many, many things. Uh, Ren Pixie, yeah, you made it this time. You know, Ren, I missed you last time. And I thought I, this might be, that was the last time, the first live stream I've done that Ren Pixie didn't make it to. So uh, I'm glad you're here this time. I, I feel whole. Uh, Dave Riotto, Northwest Montana present. Hey, that's cool. I was in Montana in uh, in June, Dave, uh, down in, um, uh, my son lives in Miles City, Montana, and we also drove up to Helena. Uh, mini Vibes, peace, Andy. There you go, Mini Vibes. Dawn Art, audio is fine, good. Uh, Liam McWilliams, how do you insert clay into your pottery? Liam, I'm not, I'm not understanding that question because the pottery is made from clay, so I'm not understanding how I would insert clay into the pottery. Um, I make the pottery out of clay, so uh, I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're asking. Isaac, will soot and gum Arabic make a good pottery paint? No, I, I don't think that would work. I don't think that would work. Um, the only way to use, because carbon will burn out in a firing. If you can, you can cover your pot in carbon. It's going to burn away during the firing. Um, Gum Arabic will make it stick before firing, but the gum Arabic gum Arabic will also burn away in the firing. So, what you um, uh, what you need in order to make carbon designs is um, you need that special smectite clay slip, and then you apply that that tarry you know um, organic paint to it like this. I don't know if you can get this to focus on it. I'll see if I can get it to focus. Focus, focus. There we go. You see, it's a little glossy. That's because it's not fired. It's it's just a it's just like syrupy, you know. Um, and then it will make carbon design. As far as I know, that's the only way to make carbon designs. You can't paint soot and get the same effect because it'll just burn away. Uh, the fire is very very hot for firing pottery. It's at least seven hundred degrees Celsius, which is pretty dang hot. Uh, okay, lost my place here. So stand by. Uh, Ooh, there's a lot of comments here. I don't know if I'm going to get to all these. Maybe I'll be doing this for hours. I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of comments here. Uh, wow. Where was I? Here we go. Found it. Uh, audio's fine. When do you know? When do you know to stop mixing temper? Um, just... Or do you have to fire your pottery? Um, you need to fig you a good starting place if you just found a wild clay is to try adding twenty percent sand to your clay. Twenty percent sand, um, you know, eighty percent clay, and, and then and then try it. Dry it. Does it does it crack easily during the drying? Fire it. Does it crack easily? You know, during the firing. Uh, if it does, you need more temper. Um, if it doesn't, you can try backing that off. Um, once you figure out what amount of temper works good for that clay, then just stick with it. Noel, uh, Noel Belknap is here. Hi, uh, Liam McWilliams. What time is it for you all? Uh, it's like four, five o'clock here. Um, I'm about halfway through. <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna, <laughs> I might be here a while. Um, audio's perfect. Thank you, Mini Vibes. Um, Dave Riotto. 5.33 Mountain Time. Uh, yeah, and it's it's 5 o'clock here on the West Coast, uh, California, Arizona time. Uh, Nakata, Nat, Naticus watched a bunch of your videos and ended up making a bunch of pinch pots. And the only place I could find them was in an old 
fire them within an old charcoal grill. It worked okay. Thanks for your videos. That's awesome. Glad you got that figured out. Uh, 12.33 a.m. here in Ireland. Wow. Go to bed, Liam. Good grief. Uh, Judith Winter. I'll be getting caught up with my sheep effigy as soon as I can. Cool. I, I hope to see that. Make sure you use the hashtag uh, Ancient Pottery August on that so that I can find those uh, on Instagram when I go to share them. Uh, Harlton Cheston. Your name's hilarious. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, the Wi-Fi jar. Oh, yeah. These are these are Wi-Fi bars. And then this is Tetris. So <laughs> it's just a test pot. I was having fun with it. Mm. Uh, Liam says that the... Uh, that the yucca fruit should ripen that way. I think they probably will too. I just, I hate to, I hate to make two trips out there for one thing. And beyond that, um, I'm worried that the animals are going to eat them if I wait a couple more weeks. I want to hurry up and get those, you know, those yucca fruits in my possession so I, I'm not worried about them getting eaten. All right. Um, Doug... Trithal, EQ, OA, Sharpie. Any cactus or succulent needs to ripen on the plant. Long time cactus grower. Interesting. Okay, Doug, that's interesting. Not going to ripen the same way as, as we would expect other fruit to because it's a succulent, huh? Um, Stacy Reimer Kazanchi. Hi, Andy from Colorado. Hey, John and Stacy, it's good to see you here. Uh, Liam could take different lengths depending on temperature and things. Uh, Mark Gibson, could you send me some mesquite beans to grow? If yes, I would email you. Um, yeah, it's going to take a long time to grow a mesquite bean from a seed, Mark. It, you'd be easier to, I mean, yeah, I'd be glad to send you some. But um, uh, I bet you could come, if you just drove south, you could dig up a little, you know, uh, seedling on the side of the road and it'd be easier. But hey, you know, uh, knock yourself out. I would be glad to send you... Um, some seeds if you want, Mark. Uh, Angel Duncan, the Tonal Odom Co-op Farm folks may be able to answer your yucca fruit question. Hmm. I've never seen yucca fruits at that uh, co-op over there, Angel, but uh, that's a good idea. They do. Might, they might actually know something about that. Farpoint Station, how pissed were you when your camera almost went up in flames in that pottery gathering? I remember seeing that video and thinking it was unreal how careless that guy was with other people's gear. Yeah, I wasn't pissed as much as I was um, uh, just you know, surprised, you, ah, you know, well, gotta go grab my camera. I wasn't really angry because I know from experience that when I'm firing, I'm super focused on the firing, uh, the temperatures, how the pots are doing. And I kind of, everything else kind of disappears. And so I know that I get in that mindset myself. So it's, it's easy to forgive other people who are probably in the same position. But yeah, no, it was, it was crazy. I turned around the camera in case you weren't, didn't watch the video. The camera was set up doing a, a time lapse on a firing, all right, um, and um, and it was just sitting there. It sat there for a half hour, and then I turned. I was doing something else. I was talking to people. I turned around, and somebody on the other side of my camera had built this raging bonfire, and my camera was, you know, ten feet away. And so I had to run over and grab the camera real fast. Um, everything worked out. The camera's okay. Uh, Naticus, when collecting clay for yourself, what do you look for in the dirt to know it will probably have a higher clay content? Oh, uh, so like, uh, crackled texture, um, uh, it'll have like a, like a soapy or a waxy texture to it, kind of a smooth, soft feeling. Um, you look on the ground and you can look for like animal tracks, human tracks, car tracks that are old, you know, that are two, three weeks old and they're just still there. The reason they're still holding their shape is there's a lot of clay. It's kind of holding that shape together. Um, those are just some of the things. Uh, bright colors sometimes. Sometimes the clay is a little more saturated than regular dirt. Uh, I have a lot of videos about finding clay in the wild. You might check those out for some, some visual help because I can, I can tell you that here. But if you watch those videos, then I'll show you examples, which would be a lot more helpful, I'm sure. Um, Raising Arizona, 2008. Where can I get white clay... White slip up here in the Phoenix area. Um, uh, Horseshoe Reservoir. So drive up north to Horseshoe Reservoir on the Verde. And there's a bunch of white clay just below the dam right on the Forest Service Road. Uh, Liam, I sieve sand and tempered clay with it, but it feels a bit gritty. Um, you know, it it's going to be grittier than store-bought clay because it's got, it's got sand in it, right? Uh, it may feel different than what you're used to. Um, try it. If you think 
there's too much to try using less next time or adding more clay to it. But uh, 20% temper with if you're using something like sand, it's going to feel a little gritty. Dawn Art. Wes is producing masterful pieces. I saw that video. Yes, uh, Wes, Wes is doing good work. And, and he just he just fired a new a new bowl a couple of days ago. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it, it's re, it came out really nice. It's a piece of that seggy orangeware, like I said. Uh, Presides Martinez. I would like to buy Smectite clay from you, but I need your address to send you money because I don't have tech ways to do it. Thank you. Um, uh, Presides, I'm probably butchering your name. I'm sorry, I just don't know that name. Presides Martinez. Um, my mailing address is in the description, the doobly-doo, of every one of my YouTube videos. So go down below, click on the description, uh, enlarge it, and at the bottom is my mailing address. Uh, so if you send me a check, I will wait for the check to clear and I'll mail you some of that clay, okay? Not me is here. Hello, not me. Uh, Liam, is silt a temper like sand or what determines does it make your pottery have? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I've been pondering it myself. Can silt be used for temper? I, I think probably so. Um, but so many clays that are silty are so unplastic that you know you just reject them and so you get in the mindset like silt is all silt is bad but i think i think any non-plastic is the same and i think that's why we can use things like diatomaceous earth or volcanic ash that are super fine because it doesn't matter so probably true but i just i just don't know for sure i haven't done that experiment yet but that'd be fun Mercedes, need your address to buy smectite slip from you yeah i just go ahead and um uh, go ahead and look in the description of the video. The doobly do. Doug, I like touching the face and also the smell. It smells very different when dry, at least to me. Um, clay? Clay smells very different when dry. Uh, yeah. Jennifer uh, McLaughlin. If I use store bought clay and I fire it in a kiln, do I still need temper? No. No. Uh, no. If you buy store bought clay and you're firing in an electric kiln, just go ahead and do it regular. Uh, the temper is going to protect it from thermal shock. Uh, that's the main thing. Not me. I've been practicing with the Hobby Lobby clay and save the wild clay I managed to find for something nice. Yeah, that's fine. That's a good idea, especially if you're just getting started, you know. Uh, Harlan Cheston, question. The wild clay that I've been processing feels soapy, waxy when dry. Could that mean it isn't actual clay? No, not necessarily. Uh, a lot of wild clay have that soapy, waxy texture. Um, you know, give it a shot and bake something. Just... Mix a little up with temper, just a small amount. Make yourself a little pinch pot and then let it dry, okay? Let it dry upside down because if you if you let a pot dry right side up, it'll rim crack a lot of times. So let it dry upside down so it dries evenly. See if it cracks, okay? If it doesn't crack, that tells you you might have enough temper in it. Now take it out and fire it with some charcoal or some wood or something. See how it does. If it cracks, then that might tell you you need more temper. If it does okay, you know, then you might just keep using it, but... You've got to build a little test bowl and you've got to run it through the whole process. And then you can see if it's any good. That's your next step, Harlan Cheston. True Universe, I found something that looks like clay, but it has a kind of earth that reflects light. I have no idea what that means. It has a kind of earth that reflects light. <laughs> no idea. Give it a try. What do you got to lose? Make a little pot. Walter Pruitt, any tips on getting pottery more smooth? You make it look very easy and great. See you in November. Cheers from Idaho. Walter Pruitt. Um, so when I'm making the pot, I'll take something sharp, like this is a deer rib bone, and I'll scrape it first. You know, scrape it smooth. And that'll help get it smoother. Uh, and then, once that's done, I'll, I'll take a smooth stone, and I'll dip it in water, and I'll go over it with a wet stone. And that'll help smooth it some more. And then, once it's getting a little towards the drier side, then I'll polish it. Um... You know, you've just got to work at it. Um, but it doesn't have to be made smooth. You you can make it smooth even after it's formed. I hope to see you in uh, November. Walter. Knights of the Pickaxe. Does it matter what temper I use? Um, you're going to get different results from different temper. Use what's easiest for you to get. For me, sand is easiest. Uh, I have a lot of grog out there that I also use. Um, but, you know, use what works for you. But, yeah, you are going to get different results. You can do some experiments and try sand compared to uh, grog uh, compared to, I don't know, diatomaceous earth or different things and, and see, uh, you know, which you like best. But yeah, they are going to be a little different. 
Um, where are we at here? James Mays. Hi from Arkansas. Andy, just got back into pottery. I have been hunting for wild clay here. Lots of low quality clays, especially red and yellow clays. Any tips for better wild clay? No. Uh, it, I mean, there's a lot of things people will tell you, you know, add vinegar to it or, or let it age a long time. There's a lot of little tricks that people like to say. But generally, those little tips about making clay better, they're marginal differences. They're going to make an okay clay a little better. They're going to make a, a, a bad clay a, a little closer to marginal, but they're not going to take a bad clay and make it a great clay. They're, they're not. They're, the, dif the, the difference is like aging and, I, you know, putting vinegar in or whatever all these little things people say. There's a bunch of them, but they're, they're mostly just super, super minuscule improvements. So don't, don't rest your hopes on taking some piece of crap clay and turn it into some really great thing. You've you got to get out there and look some more. You know, um, I don't know about Arkansas because I haven't done any clay hunting in Arkansas, but I lived in Oklahoma and it is chuck full of good clay and it's close to Arkansas. So um, if you maybe go a little farther afield and maybe you'll find some, some better clay. Um, I would just keep experimenting with different things. Also, uh, I know Arkansas has a lot of topography, you know, and, and uh, hills and mountains and stuff. And if you get a, a geologic map, it may give you some clues on where to look as well. Uh, Isaac. Will soot and gum Arabic make a good pottery paint? Oh, already answered that. Uh, Robert Swain. Hi, Uncle Andy. Great video one again. Keep up, keep it up, man. Uh, Robert is my nephew. He lives here in Tucson. Good to see you here, Robert. Uh, Frank Morris. Greetings from the members country. Right on, Frank. I'd like to see some members pottery from you. True Universe. Question. I made a pot for cooking, but when I put water or soap, soup in it, the water just goes straight through it like a piece of clothing? How can I fix it? Man, that's crazy. I mean... If I put liquid in my pots, they do seep a little bit, but it doesn't run through it like a sieve. Are you sure you don't have cracks in your pottery, maybe? If not, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I just don't even, I can't even imagine how it would run through it like that. Send me a video. I'd like to see that. Uh, Isaac, did Native Americans ever use soot as a paint? There's that no question again. I don't think soot would work. Soot was just going to burn off of your pot. So it is used for a lot of things. It's used for paint, you know, if you're painting a picture uh, on canvas. Uh, it's great to make, you know, ink out of. But pottery has to stand up to, like, temperatures over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It, it, anything like soot is just going to burn away. You're not going to have anything left. I don't think that's a... Don Art sent me four ninety nine. Thanks for answering my question. And he thanks, Don Art. I appreciate that. Oh, lost my place again. Uh, BJ, I put one of my red clay pots in the sun a couple of days ago and got... 168 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, that's not surprising. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jess and Jin sent me 20 bucks. Thank you for what you do here. You are one of a kind. Here's a tip for a drink in that name. I have a question about marl. How useful would it be as a raw material for prehistoric pottery? Would it need special processing? Um, <clears throat> marl is a combination of clay and calcium carbonate. And uh, we have marl here in, in southern Arizona. And I know some places like England, there's lots and lots of marl as well. Um, I, I, marl would could work if it has enough clay content and you keep your firing temperature down. So the trouble with calcium carbonate is once it goes over about 820 Celsius, uh, that calcium carbonate turns into calcium oxide. Then when the pot gets wet and it doesn't even have to have water put on it, it can just be humidity in the air, uh, then it starts creating little calcium pops and it makes little pops all over your pot. I'll show you one right here so um this is a vase i made for my um i think it was the coil pottery for beginners video about a year ago or so uh and if i can get it to focus on it you see the little white pops all over that that's places where that that calcium oxide is in the pot and this pot hasn't been wet i didn't you know i didn't wipe it with a rag it's a, it's literally uh humidity that's causing those pops to pop up and so um if you were going to make pottery with marl, and like I said, I think it is possible, you would have to be careful to keep your firing temperature between about seven and 800 degrees Celsius. If you got over 800, you'd get into the realm where you might actually create pops in your pottery. And it can actually, it can get so bad that the pot just falls apart and crumbles. This one has a little bit of it. Uh, some pots have a lot. So a marl would probably have a lot. Mojave Bohemian. Hello, Andy. Everyone... Everyone, I am in Northeast Arizona. Hey, uh, good to see you here. Jessigen, also hello from 
Bosnia. Good to see you here from Bosnia. Maybe he means the riveting technique, by the way. My brother says hello. Uh, that's nice, Ren. As your, does your brother watch my videos too? Um, the, having to do with put clay in pottery. Well, my next video is going to talk a little bit about the riveting technique, so maybe that'll help you. I don't know. How do you insert glaze in your pot? How do you insert glaze into your pot? Um, weren't you the one that said how to insert clay into your pot earlier? Um, I don't use glaze, so I couldn't tell you. My pots are always um, just raw clay, you know, and slipped, uh, not glazed. So I, I really can't help you with glaze. Um, Franick Sinhack. Sorry, I'm ruining your name and I apologize. Question, is all wood good for outdoor firing? I live in Europe, so I have mostly pine, birch, some oak and spruce. Do they burn hot enough? Yeah, yeah, you can use about any wood, but you want it to be good and dry. Um, now, some woods... Some woods are better than others, all right? A good hardwood that burns uh, hot and clean is going to be a lot better than like a, a pine that's going to be really kind of sooty sometimes. But yeah, it can all be used. Um, I, I have a friend who, who fires with, you know, scrap lumber and, and um, uh, pallets and stuff. So yeah, any wood can be used, uh, but make sure it's dry. That's going to be the key. Uh, James Mays, hi Andy, as a makeshift for small tests, can I fire in my forge? I have no idea. I don't know enough about forges to know. Um, you need to get up over 700 C, and you may know what your forge gets to on the inside of the forge, right? And then you need to you need to have some air circulation around that pottery too. It can't just be, you know, coals up against the pot all around. Usually, you want a little bit of air circulation. Um, but yeah, possibly. I know people that fire in wood stoves. So, I mean, I, it is definitely in the realm of possibility. I just don't have any experience with it, James. In fact, I not only don't have any experience with it, I have so little experience with forges that in my mind, I'm having trouble visualizing what the firebox in the forge would be. I don't think you would put it on top of the forge, like where you work with the iron, because you're not going to heat evenly. You're going to heat it unevenly and it's going to crack. Um, so... Jay Sanders, the unripe yucca fruit will have... I was thinking your forge would have like a firebox or something. I just I just don't know enough about forges, James. That's the problem. Uh, the unripe yucca fruit will have high starch content. Lightly roasting them should convert the starch to sugar, and then they should be suitable for processing as paint. Well, there's an interesting idea. Pre-roast them uh, to get those starches to turn to sugars. That's a good idea. Journey with Nicole. Just chiming in here. I dehydrate purple prickly pear skins for a dye and powder it up. Would you be interested in using it for a dye for your pottery? No, dyes never work for pottery because uh, it's an, the dye is an organic substance and it's going to burn away in those super high temperatures. So um, although it, it seems reasonable to make colorful pottery paint, uh, the pottery is painted before it's fired and therefore anything that's a dye is just going to combust. So not useful, but thank you for that. Uh, that's really cool that you do that. James, uh, the yucca fruit is also super tasty after it's roasted. Oh, so you do have some experience with yucca fruit, huh? Interesting. Uh, Arthur Roca Mata, the creator. Hi. Hey, good to see you here, Arthur. Nat Natekis. Thanks for the answers. You're welcome, Natekis. True universe. When I'm going to remove the clay from the ground, do I only get the cracked pieces or I dig? Um, no, you can dig down if it's the same material, but you got to be sure, got to be careful because, you know, strata is in layers, right? So what you see on the surface, that that layer may be two, three, four feet thick, or it might be an inch thick, right? Just be aware that as you're digging down, if you hit a different layer and it starts looking like a different substance, stop, right? Make sure you're getting the same material you're seeing on the surface because you will have layers in the ground and you only want what, what the clay one. You don't want anything else. Okay, where am I at here? Uh, Question, do you know about the cube rule of food? I don't know anything about a cube rule for food, Arthur. Uh, Mark Gibson, every time I try to reach anyone, teach anyone how to do anything, they surpass me quickly. Yeah, story of my life. It's okay, though. I, I don't, I, you know, be glad for them and don't worry about it. We're all on different journeys. Um, John Heishman. Can you throw wild clay on a pottery wheel? Absolutely. People do it all the time. There's um there's a group on Facebook called uh, the Wild Clay Club, and 
and they're people from all over the world. The, the administrator is in Australia, and they're, um, you know, they're uh, proponents of using wild clay. And most of them are, are you know, standard wheel potters. Uh, there's a recent book that was written. You can find it on Amazon. I think it's called Wild Clay, but it's about wild clay. Um, it was put, written last year. Uh, it's a beautiful book. Um, and and the people that wrote the book are wheel potters. You know, they're not they're not primitive potters. Absolutely, I mean, people all over the world use wild clay on wheels. Uh, the the difference is you're not going to want to use really coarse like sand temper because if you've got you got a lot of sand temper and your wheel throwing, it's going to tear your hands up. But yeah, oh, absolutely you can. Um, Arthur, he is reading messages not in the chat. How awful. Who, me? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm reading only messages in the chat, Arthur. I, I haven't read anything else. Uh, Chad Harry, greetings from Oklahoma. Do you know if ancient pottery makers used a grid system to draw symmetrical designs around their pottery or just freehand? Um, I think if we look, you know, historically that, that they were definitely freehanding it. Um, but I think there's little tricks, right? I mean, they didn't have pencils in ancient times. A, a lot of a lot of modern, you know, even native potters, they'll, they'll sketch with pencils before they do it. Um, but in ancient times, they didn't have that. Now I've used bits of charcoal. You can pull just a little piece of charcoal out of the out of the fire and and mark make little ticks on it, you know, to help you. Or you can sketch in because that charcoal burns away in the fire. Uh, unfortunately, the the um, the pencil will not. So a lot of times, even even maybe not sketch the whole design out with pencil or with charcoal, but I'll need to like divide it into equal four or eight bits. And so I'll take the charcoal, I'll just like make a mark and a mark and a mark and a mark. And then when I'm freehanding, those will help me make sure that I caked up the right amount of space and everything flows around the pot. So um, that's what I know. Um, you know, we don't really know what they were doing prehistorically, but we can look at historically how native potters were working in, say, the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, and get an idea of maybe how they worked. And that tells us they were mostly freehanding it. Arthur, he is not reading the chat. Arthur, who are you talking about? I, are you talking about me? I'm absolutely reading the chat. What, what are you smoking? Uh, glass Gavin. Sounds like mica in the clay. Hmm, I don't know what that refers to. Oh, the, the, the shiny parts. Yeah, that you could be right. You could be right. It could be mica. Uh, James Mays agreed. Sounds like mica. Yeah, okay. I think we're all agreed. What sounds like mica? Um, what are you talking about? Arthur? <laughs> Arthur, he's answering chat questions methodically and in order. He is still way back in the chat, though. Uh, Arthur, uh, when will he reach my first minute? <laughs> I've already read it, Martha, but I'm sorry. There's a lot of questions today. There's more questions than usual uh, today. In fact, um, it's it's 5.23. I've been doing this almost an hour, and usually my live streams are an hour, and um, I've still got a ways to go. So I'm going to stick with it until I answer all these. So uh, I'm sorry if it's taking a while, but there's a lot of questions today. <laughs> okay, where was I at? I lost my place. I got excited. Um Harlan Cheston, thanks for answering my question, and I hope to have some pottery soon. Yeah, uh, upload your pictures to Instagram and, uh, and show me what you got, Harlan Cheston. True Universe, the clay that I found has a gray color. What is the difference between the colors of clay? Uh, n uh, almost nothing. Um, I get questions a lot. People go out and they find clay, and they're like, oh, I found red clay, or I found pink clay, or I found purple clay, or, you know, they found some color. What, what's it like? You know, and you can't make any generalizations about clay based on the color. And some some gray clay is really great. Some gray clay is terrible, right? Some red clay is really terrible. Some gray red clay is really good. You just it just doesn't know. You've got to uh, you've got to make you know work a little bit up. Add the twenty percent temper, just, just a handful. Uh, make yourself a little pinch pot. Let it dry. That'll tell you something. You can see how much it shrinks. You can see if it tends to crack, uh, and then and then take it out and fire it. That's going to tell you something. And then you can know, hey, this is pretty good clay, or, oh, this stuff is terrible. You know, it sticks all over my hands. I can barely use it. You know, you'll learn things just by doing that. You've got to go through the process to know if your clay is any good. Um, generally, the colors are just um, minerals that are in the clay. So, like, red clays have iron. Yellow clays have iron. Um, you know, gray clays, uh, a lot of times that's organic matter that's in the clay. So, uh, they come from different things. And they change color after the firing, too. Red clays will usually fire red. 
But like gray clays, they come out any color because if that gray is organic matter, once that burns away, you may find that you have a brown clay or you have a red clay or you have a white clay. You don't know until you burn that carbon out and fire in it. Okay. Um, James Mays. Thanks, Andy. You're welcome, James. Um, here's a name in Arabic. I can't pronounce it. Sorry about that. How do I get rid of clay mold? You know, there is an answer to that. I just don't have the answer. Um, I kind of think what people add to their clay. Is it vinegar or is it bleach that they add to get rid of mold? There is something they add to it. Um, you'll have to do some research because I don't know. I've, I don't. Here's what I do. A lot of clays will tend to get moldy or stink. You know, after you, uh, you dig up a wild clay, you mix it up, you wrap it up in plastic, and you come back two weeks later and it smells like an open sewer. True story. Happens all the time. Um, and so the, the real answer to avoiding those problems is mix up your clay like a day or two before you need it. Use it, use it up, and then mix up more clay and use it so it doesn't sit around for a month or two, uh, and then it won't get stinky or moldy. Or that. That's really a good answer. Arthur Rock, but he didn't read me. Andy, why aren't you reading me? Uh, I'm reading you right now, Arthur. And he is getting close. <laughs> uh, let's go. Come on. Just read James's message. Arthur, come on, man. You've got to stop being impatient. What are you, 12? Lala Art Studio. Andy, love you and your channel. I'm in Northern California in the shadows of Mount Shasta. Okay, so first, Lala Art Studio. I used to live in Northern California in the shadows of Mount Shasta. I lived in Redding for two years. Uh, question. I dug some red dirt processed, but not sure how to make it more elastic. Oh, more plastic. Yeah. So um, if your clay isn't plastic, uh, the only thing you can do is either add some more, some clay that's better uh, to it. You, you, know, you can even add commercial clay to it, something to make it more plastic, or uh, levigate it. That is the process by we mix it in water, let the set, larger particles settle out, pour off that pure clay, and then let it dry, because that's going to get rid of all those impurities, and you may find it more plastic. But it's possible. In fact, it's likely that your clay that you've processed is not very good clay, and therefore you might be better off just finding a better clay. All right, uh, there's Arthur again. I'm not going to leave until Andy reads my message. I've read a lot of your messages, man. Bro, calm down. <laughs> uh, the only crazy cat. Arthur, the more comments you post, the more comments he has to read. <laughs> Isaac, would oak galls and ferrous sulfate make a pottery paint? It makes a good ink. Yeah, I think you're talking very, I think you're thinking about it very differently. Um, I know that oak galls and ferric oxide make good ink and and somebody asked earlier about dyes made from prickly pears. You got to remember that all those organic compounds that, like you're talking about, they're going to disappear in the temperatures of a pottery firing. So um, I, I don't think you could try it. I don't have any experience with it. And I'm certainly open to people experimenting, you know. But I think, um, I think probably that's just going to burn away and leave you with nothing. You're better off to use minerals. Uh, than try to use organic materials. Um, the way that the natives in the Southwest used organic paint is very, very unique, uh, and it requires the right slip. It's all about the slip that's painted on. So, I, I, I would question it. But hey, you know, prove me wrong. It's all good. Uh, Ren Pixie, yes, he watches. He doesn't have much choice. LOL. He also takes me out clay hunting. That's awesome. Say hi to your brother for me, Ren Pixie. Um, Liam McWilliams. What corn grinder do you use for dry clay? Could you put a link on it for the comments? Yeah, I'm not going to put it in the comments because I'm not going to look it up now. It'll take time. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the corn grinder I use is made by a company called Estrella. E-S-T-R. -E Let me write it out. It'll help me. E-S-T-R-E-L-L-A, -E -E Estrella corn grinder. You can find them on Amazon. They run about 40 bucks. And they're all um, cast iron, so they're really good. They'll last for years, so that's a good corn grinder. Uh, and I will link it in the in the doobly doo after the live chat is over. That way, if you're watching this later, the link will be in the doobly doo for that. Um, Dave Riotto, would molasses make good paint? Yes, I have experimented with molasses, and it will if it's painted on the smectite clay and fired right, it can make good organic paint. Um, some people. Uh, that I know that have done more work with molasses than I do say um, 
molasses is not good because like this um, this mesquite paint here once it's dry you can touch it it's it's not really sticky but what I've heard is that molasses never really dries it's always sticky so it's a little more easy to make a mess of things but yeah it can work um, uh, Arthur bye I'm going he saw my message I told you I'd leave if he saw my message I'm gonna stay until he reads my question. <laughs> Kevin Avery what is the biggest reason for pots cracking while drying and in heating process um not enough temper right uneven drying so when you make a pot uh, that clay the clay is expansive when it gets wet it expands when it draw when it dries it contracts and if it doesn't contract evenly then there's stresses on the pot and it's going to crack so uh, you want to let it dry nice and slow you want to turn that pot upside down so that because the rim has more surface area and it'll dry faster turn it upside down cover it with a piece of cloth or something or put it in a cabinet where it's going to dry nice and slow uh, that's going to cause most of those cracks. Uh, so m more temper is the answer to helping it dry more e dry evenly too. More temper and, and help it dry slower. Okay. Uh, lost my place again. Every once in a while this jumps and I just totally lose where I'm at. Oh boy. Okay. I'm getting there. Hello, Rodney. Do you remember back in the 60s or 70s when craft potters were making these big bowls like mugs? with two cowboy boots for the foot of the giant mug. Um, well, I, I was not around in the 60s, and I was a small child in the 70s, so I really don't remember. Um, like, so it was a bowl with feet. I've seen pictures, bowls with feet. Yeah, I've seen pictures. Frank Sinekak, uh, how, how to see if the temperature is right when firing without a thermometer? How long should it be fired? Do you just fire a teepee? And, yeah, so when I first started, I would do that. I would just put the wood on and let it fire. And then I'd look at the pot and go, oh, look, it didn't get hot enough. Or oh, look, maybe it got too hot. And, and kind of eventually you do enough of those, you get a feel for, you know, how much wood to use or, you know, those kind of things. And you get better at it. So that's one way to do it for sure. Uh, another way is if you can get a spot where you can look in and see the pot, okay, Maybe you've got wood all around and you can't see the pot. Leave yourself a little crack where you can look in and see the pot. Um, that's going to help you a lot um, because as that temperature ramps up, um, that pot is going to get dark and sooty and carbony just from the, the carbon in the atmosphere, from the smoke and the fire. And then as that pot gets over about 600, 620 Celsius, then it's going to start burning that carbon off. Now you're getting close. So that's a clue. Once that carbon is all burned off and it's clean, you've reached at least 700 degrees Celsius usually, and it's probably fully fired. So that's definitely a clue. If you never burn off all the carbon, you haven't got there. You're below 600 and you haven't got hot enough to make ceramics. So uh, that's a good clue to look for if you don't have a gun or, you know, it's a way to measure temperature. Arthur, there are some expectations like the salad. There are some expectations expectations like the salad with no starch at all and the cake with starch is not in the cube expectations I don't know what you're saying Arthur true universe uh, how what can create these empty spaces filled with air on the walls of my pot empty spaces filled with air are they like pops are they holes in your pot I don't understand maybe there's organic matter in the clay and that's burning out and leaving voids is that possible Chris, hey, just wanted to tell you ever since binge watching your videos, every time my wife and myself are hiking, I'm now noticing clay. Yeah, once you start finding it, you'll see it everywhere. That's the fun part. Uh, Dave Riotto, LOL, what you smoking? <laughs> Seriously. Kevin Avery, what happens when you use too much sand or temper? Uh, if you use too much sand, you just your clay becomes less plastic. It's not even cohesive. Like You have trouble keeping it together. It won't like, crack and fall apart as you're making it. Um, it's not going to affect the firing. As long as you've got it to hold together, it's going to be okay. But you're going to have trouble. You have too much temper, you're going to have trouble forming a pot. It's just not going to stick together. So uh, you're lost plasticity at that point. Uh, early artist. It's 8.30 p.m. here in New Jersey. Hey, that's not too bad. Dave Riotto. I'm from Passiac, Patterson, and Newark. Dave Riotto. live in Montana now. Arthur, I thought you weren't reading the chat and... I'm not legal age of smoking. Uh, I'm not surprised. 
Uh, Kevin Avery, is it best to wait a while when you first mix clay and water for clay to dry some to start making pots? Uh, when you first mix the clay up, uh, I usually wrap it up and let it sit for at least a couple hours. Now, some people want it to age months. Again, I think that I think the amount of change you're going to find in months is really, really marginal. Uh, most of that change is happening in the first two, three hours. So, yes, if you just mix it up and form a pot, it's not going to be quite as plastic. If you wait a couple hours, it's going to be much better. Um, but don't let it dry. Wrap it up in plastic or put it in a bin or something so that it can stay moist. Um, but yeah, let it age a little. Mm -hmm. uh, True Universe, Andy, uh, you are a cool guy, smart and dedicated. Thank you. Thank you, True Universe. Uh, you're reading in a long delay. You read in one minute late. Arthur, probably 40 seconds. Kevin Avery, what does it mean if the clay is sticking all over my hands? Does that mean clay is not ideal? Uh, yeah, your clay is too sticky. And usually sticky clays are very plastic clays. Um, so uh, if you add more temper, you can possibly you know, neutralize some of that stickiness. Um, it's possible, though, that your clay is too sticky and it won't be usable for pottery. So, like, Only some small percentage of clays are actually good for making pottery. Um, so you can temper that a little. You can add temper to it and kind of hopefully lose some of that stickiness. But if it's still too sticky after you've added temper... Uh, then, you know, it's just not good clay. Uh, the only crazy cat. I only discovered you a couple hours ago and luckily noticed the live icon. Anyway, I absolutely love no way to fire pottery unless you can somehow use a microwave. Some people do, but I don't know anything about it. Uh, the only crazy cat. So is there a way to use the sun to dry pottery for decent results? Uh, yeah, if your pottery dries too fast, it will crack. So... Putting it in the sun is usually a terrible idea, unless it's very, very dry and it's almost fully dry. You know, at the very end, you can set it in the sun. Generally, I cover it with a piece of cloth or a plastic bag. I put it in a cabinet, someplace where the air won't circulate around it much. Uh, so be careful. You could put it in a hot car and it would dry fast, but you may come back and just have bits and pieces of your pot. Uh, Lala Art Studio, I'm in Shasta Lake. I've got a good friend who lives in, uh, up in, by Shasta Lake. Uh, the only crazy cat. And hey, I only live 30 miles from Redding. Right on. Right on. It's a beautiful country up there. It's not like the rest of California. It's beautiful. Uh, I mean, California is all beautiful. Don't get me wrong. But it's, it's like a whole different place. Uh, True Universe, can I use the clay they put in the cat poop? No. No, the, the clay they make kitty litter out of is bentonite. It has a super high shrinkage rate. You cannot make pottery from it. Uh, Puck Kingerly. Uh, got to shore before it's too late. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Good to see you. Dreamland escaped the chains. Oh, lost my place again. It just jumped. Okay, here we are. Um, I sadly don't have a pot in, on my house because I don't have clay. Hi, Dreamy. I've learned a lot. I'm sorry. I'm just reading through a bunch of things that aren't questions. Um... I got my clay for a baseball field. Hi, Andy. I'm on the central coast of California and can only find a tannish fired clay. Do ceramic shops sell low fired clays? I want a white slip. Yeah, absolutely they do. Um, almost any uh, clay you know, supplier will have low fire clays. Uh, and, and New Mexico clay has a low fire, a white micaceous clay that's really beautiful. You should check that out. Um, yeah, absolutely. Walter Pruitt, what music do you listen to when making pottery? I find myself listening to classical guitar music. Um, yeah, I, Walter, I have a pretty eclectic taste in music. You'd be surprised. I, sometimes I'm listening to, um, uh, you know, folk music. Sometimes I'm listening to country music. Sometimes I'm listening to, you know, just all kinds of things. It's just crazy. And sometimes I listen to, you know, like talk radio type stuff too. Um, uh, podcasts and that kind of thing. Um, probably my favorite is, you know, classic rock, the Beatles and, and, um, that kind of thing. Tom Petty, you know, um, electric light orchestra, but I, I listen to a lot of different things. Uh, I'm, I'm reading through a bunch of stuff that aren't questions. I apologize. Oh man, this thing's doing weird stuff. Um, I've never had so many chats in, in any live stream I've ever done.
I'm almost at the bottom, I think. What time we got? 539, not too bad, not too bad. Uh, hey, sir, search up for cube rule, the food is, you skip my, me oh, that guy again. I'm the original creator of my name. It's 130 in Ireland, uh, 930 in Brazil, 830 in Florida, I'm gonna do it. Can you fire clay pots too long? Oh yeah, um, no, it's not the length of time. You can fire it as long as you want. It's the temperature, if you can fire them too hot. If you get them too hot, they start to you know fall apart or melt or something, so. Uh, but the amount of time really isn't that big of a deal. Um, my brother said, angry potters lose their temper. Eh, that's for sure. But what if the paint my pottery after it's been fired? Um, if you paint your pottery after it's been fired, then you can use acrylic paint or whatever, right? Uh, I know some people that use acrylic paint on pottery that's already been fired. The traditional way is to paint it before firing. That sets the paint and makes it permanent. But yeah, you can paint after it's fired if you want with whatever. Um, to your universe, wait. So I need to wait for my pot to dry before I put it in the fire? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, good night, true universe. Gonna go to sleep now. Uh, only crazy cat. If I may ask a truly beginner question, what is slip? Slip is just liquid clay. You just mix the clay up really, really thin. Uh, and then, you know, in, in, I, I had it in a tub and I mixed it up with water. And then I actually just used a paintbrush to paint it to the outside of the pot. So slip is just l clay that's, that's been mixed up really, really thin. And so it can be painted on. Uh, Chase Nuvertel, uh, my clay is growing some type of mold. Uh, no, it... If you collect wild clay, it a lot of times it'll grow something on it. Um, and I, like I said, I don't know what the answer is. There is something people put in it, bleach or something, I think. Um, but you you have to look it up, or I'll have to look it up later because I don't I don't know what it is right now. Um, what is your most and least favorite pots? Oh gosh, I don't know. I don't I don't know. That's a hard question, Liam. I I like a lot of different pottery. Uh, prehistoric pottery for sure is my favorite. Least favorite, like modern pottery, probably. <laughs> Bunny Rabbit, hey Andy, thanks for answering questions. Favorite brushes and paints you have for your pottery at the moment? Brushes, brushes. Oh gosh, I don't even have any with me here. Um, there's a really, there's a really great liner brush that I bought at Hobby Lobby, and it's got a long, long bristle, pretty fine log bristle, and it's great for pulling lines. So when you're painting, you just pull that line across the pot. Uh, you know, you lay the brush down. I don't have a brush with me. Lay the brush down on the pot, and, and you don't, you're used to painting like this, but lay it down and pull it along the pot, and you can make a nice straight line. That, that's probably my favorite brush. Um, favorite brushes and paints? I don't know. I make my own paint, so um, organic mesquite bean paint, maybe. Uh, Kevin Avery, Andy, you're awesome. Thank you so much for this Q&A. Really appreciate the amazing work you do, and you're teaching us all passing down lessons. Uh, I appreciate it, Kevin. Yeah, that, that's my job, and, um, and I enjoy it. Uh, what is black iron oxide? Uh, black iron oxide is something that they sell at ceramic stores. I don't have a lot of experience with it because I don't usually buy stuff at ceramic stores. Um, I collect iron oxides in the wild and they're not generally black, they're red. So I don't know how you would make a black iron oxide because if you oxidize the iron, it turns red. So it makes no sense to me. I don't know. Lala Art Studio, get a hold of me. Create. Oh, I see. Uh, black iron mixed with oxygen. Uh, only crazy cat. So the main reason to fire rather than air or sun is to do it faster. To fire rather than air. So there are chemical changes in the fire, I could assume. Um, well, firing, you get the pottery up to like 700 Celsius, it becomes ceramic, it becomes permanent. If you just air dry the pot, it stays fragile and it can get wet and it can melt and stuff. So firing the pottery is, the, firing your pot is the only way to make it into actual pottery. Otherwise, it's just dry mud. Uh, Ancient Americas is here. Hey, man. Good to see you. Are there any types of pots you'd like to try to replicate that you've never attempted? Oh, man. Yeah, there's tons. There's tons. And people ask me all the time. They say, well, oh, when are you going to do, you know, pottery from England? Or when are you going to do pottery from Africa? Or, you know, different places around the world. And I say, man, there's so many types here in the Southwest. Maybe someday I'll get through them and then I can start looking outside of my area. But uh, I'm fortunate because here in the Southwest there is such a rich tradition of, of pots and those those there's so many different cultures and different little 
things they did, even if I'm not trying to create a certain pot, just to figure out how they made all these different types, how they fired it, how they made their paint and stuff. Yeah, there's endless there's endless questions about how things were made here. So I'm really enjoying digging into it. And there's there's a million types still. There's a million types I haven't touched. Trincheris. Trincheris culture is close to where I live. And they made purple on red pottery. Man, I'd love to dig into that sometime. I've never touched it, you know. Uh, the member stuff I've just barely touched on. And there's there's a lot of depth there. Um, you know, the stuff up north, the, the Mesa Verde black and white. It's been done, right? Like Clint Swink has a really great book. Uh, I'll put a link in the doobly-doo for that. Uh, about making, firing in a trench kill and making Mesa Verde style pottery. I've never done it, you know? I would love to, to do that. There's so many. There's so, many. Um, so yeah, um, just there's so many things I'd love to try. I can't even name any one in particular. Um, I'll, I'll pick one. I'll pick one. Let's see. Um, one I've never done. Uh, oh, here it is. Here it is. Um, Kanishba polychrome. So look that one up online. It's a really rare type. Kanishba polychrome. It's one of the, like White Mountain Redware type, but it's the very, very end of that series, right before everybody left, moved out of that country. Uh, and it's kind of like black and red on kind of a brown or kind of orangey colored paste. Beautiful pottery. I've never done it. So there you go. Um, let's see, Puck Kingery, do you ever do a Maria Martinez style pot? No, uh, Maria Martinez's family is still making that pottery up there in in, um, in San Ildefonso Pueblo. There's nothing I could do that would even come close to what they're doing. You know, if you want one of those pots, you know, go visit the Martinez in New Mexico. I, yeah, I don't, I don't do, I don't do living traditions, right? Like uh, I got Hopi friends who make Hopi pottery. I, I'm not going to make Hopi pottery. A, I don't want to compete with them. B, I don't want to step on their toes so to speak you know insult them because i'm i'm trying to make native pottery I, i'm trying to make prehistoric stuff that has been long abandoned um so yeah no I, I i i've never done i have no interest in doing maria martinez style pottery because i know some of maria martinez's family um facebook friends you know not like in person friends we don't have dinner together or anything but um and, you know and i respect what they're doing they're, they do great work yeah um the only crazy cat, uh, Liam Wilson. Could you buy molds or even bowls or pots instead of uneven pots? Could you buy molds for? Uh, I suppose I I don't know if they. I don't do a lot of time like looking in ceramic stores and buying things from ceramic stores, so I'm not aware of what all they have. But they probably sell molds for bowls and stuff. I just I like making my own stuff, so I don't. But yeah, you probably could. Uh, when the mold begins to grow on the bag or bucket causing discoloration, you can spray the outer surface of the clay with bleach water. Well, there you go. There's your answer right there. So the person that was asking about mold in your pottery, uh, Dave Riotto says, uh, quarter cup of bleach per gallon and, uh, and spray it inside the, the bag and, and it should kill the mold. So there's, there's your answer. What is the Beck's black pottery paint? Um, I just answered this in my last video. Uh, Isaac, go back and watch the last vi the last video I made. What what was the um what was it called? I don't remember now. Let's see. Uh, the last video I made was uh, the four easiest natural pottery colors. You got to go watch it. Okay, that's the answer to my question, uh, to that question. Uh, Liam, do you con or is considered copying someone else's pottery? Uh, I want to make one to two centimeter miniature pottery. Is wild clay good enough for that? One to two centimeter? Wow, I don't know. I don't know, that's pretty small. Uh, it, it, old? I don't know. It could, it depends on the clay. I mean, some clay is really good and some clay isn't, but you're right, you want, you want a really good wild clay and you're gonna want a really fine temper like volcanic ash or diatomaceous earth because um, if you use sand, I mean, it's, it's way too coarse for that kind of work. All right, let me get. I'm getting to the bottom. Um, out there, if you only tell, you already know it. Yeah. Uh, and thanks for answering the questions, Andy. Uh, you're welcome, Franic Sin Kak. That's a name I can't say. Walter, do you ever plan to do a physical release of your book? <laughs> uh, I appreciate that, Walter. Um, but, you know, no, no, probably not that book, okay? That book, my book is called Mud Puzzles, and it's not, it's not a how-to-make pottery book. It's, it's about ancient Arizona, 
and kind of what I learned by digging in trying to make this pottery, kind of what I learned, or I think I learned about the ancient people and what was happening here in the 1300s. Um, and I just don't know if it has a really broad enough appeal, but there's been a number of people who've said, boy, if you ever make a, a printed copy, I really want one, uh, you know, maybe someday. What I want to do, Walter, is I want to write a book that is a, a complete guide to primitive pottery, a nice thick book with lots of pictures and diagrams and, and everything about making primitive pottery. And, and that would be a good book to have printed. Uh, because if you're if you're making pottery and you're reading out of the book, you're going to want to set the book up and you know while you're working on the clay and then be able to look up and reference it. That's going to be important. The other one is it, not. I don't, I don't think it has a broad enough appeal that I'm going to sell that many copies anyway. Um, the Q. What do the earliest pieces of pottery that we know of look like? Um, you know, it's like crude pottery. They're not great. Um, I did a video where I talked some about the the early, early pottery. And, um, you know, the ones around here, here in the Tucson area, they have some of the earliest pottery in the Southwest. They start out with little figurines. And then they start making seed jars, rather rather closed jars, because they want to store their grains and keep mice out. Um, but, I mean, all over the world there's pottery in different cultures. So it's all different, of course. I want to one day be able to make biblical pottery. And there's people, Isaac, over in um, in Israel that, that do make pottery like... Uh, like they had in Bible times. You should look it up. There was somebody just posted on, I have a Facebook group called Primitive Pottery, if you're on Facebook, and um, a guy just posted recently uh, with some pictures of making uh, some primitive pottery in Israel. Very interesting. Um, I'm trying to get through these. I have a miniature pottery with wild clay. I've pit fire things less than one centimeter tall. Biggest problem is not losing them in the fire. Yep, done that. In all my workshops, people always tend to want to make little miniature things, especially towards the end of the class. They want to get something really fast, an extra thing done. And then when you fire it, you know, you end up digging through the coals with a stick trying to uh, find the pots. What if I get a little more than you do and then you buy me items? I don't know what that means, Liam. Andy, I'm truly grateful for your kindness and generosity, sharing your passion and knowledge with all of us. You're welcome. Lala Art Studio, I appreciate that. Have you ever considered making Hoacom ceramic effigy sensors? I'm not super into Hoacom pottery. I've made some. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe someday I will. In my, um, in my Ancient Potters Club, every month we make a different project. And so we're always looking for new projects to make that we haven't already made. So maybe someday we'll make that. Maybe we'll even do like a monthly challenge and other people can try their hands at it. Harold and Cheston, if you self-publish through Amazon, they have an option to self-print copies. Yeah, I didn't, though. Mine's just a PDF uh, ebook that you can buy on my website. Okay, uh, one last thing I want to talk about before we wrap this up. Where are we at? 5.52, wow. Um, longest live stream ever uh, on my channel. <laughs> um, uh, let me show you... Um, let me show you uh, what, I, what I've done. It's been such a crazy summer. I wanted, I wanted to show you what, what I've been doing. Okay. So, oh, this is the next project. So I talked about the, the monthly replication challenge. Uh, last month, we, we or this month, August, we made uh, this sheep pot. And mine's almost done. A lot of people have already finished theirs. Um, next month, uh, in September, we're doing this, um, what are they called? Neck banded, I think. The, like these large jars, these large cylindrical jars with the neck bands. That's, that's the project next month, so. If you want to join us, um, you can get started now and then upgrade, upload it to Instagram with the hashtag Ancient Pottery September when you get one done. And then at the end of the month or early next month, I'll share them all uh, with everybody. So that'll be a fun project. And if you want help doing it, then uh, go to my website, uh, join the Ancient Potters Club, and we'll be doing that in a Zoom class every Wednesday night. We'll be working on our, our neck banded jar. So that'll be a fun project. That's what's coming up. Uh, now, uh, my summer has been crazy. So the first thing we did, we went to Disneyland in April. This was for our anniversary, my wife and I. So it started out really good. We were doing all kinds of fun things. And, and then um, I, got, I got in contact with the Thornburgs. Now, Thornburgs were these pottery replicators from back in the 80s and 90s, 2000s. They were really, really super expert. And they kind of helped me get started in pottery replication. They gave me a lot of information that I was able to use. And, and so they invited me to their house and they, they've shared a lot of information with me. And he gave me 
like all of his firing notes, and I was able to digitize those. And, and then he gave me all of his test tiles. I've got like 50 or more test tiles here that I'm supposed to be cataloging. Um, but then, as soon as I got those, um, I had to go because I went to Montana for a month uh, to visit my son and my grandson. This is my grandson right here. And so we spent the whole month of June in Montana when you know I'm, I got things to do on my channel. I'm supposed to be digitizing all those test tiles and um, so that was fun, but then when I got home, uh, then I got sick. Well, no, I got home the 1st of July. I wasn't sick most of July, but towards the end of July, I got sick. And then uh, I've been sick all the way up till almost now. So I am I'm feel like I'm way behind this summer because I, I had all these things I wanted to do. Like I said, I started out doing a lot of stuff, and then pff, it all came to a stop because I had I went to Montana, and then I came home, and then I got sick, and I feel like June, July, August have just been spinning my wheels and I have a lot of things I want to accomplish so um, hopefully I'll, I'll I'll get it in gear here in September and get some stuff done um, and hopefully see some of you at the kiln conference um, I've got I've got about six spaces left in my mug workshop in November that's taught here in Tucson it's a three day class um, the kiln conference is the end of September 1st of October three days in, Bill, in Blanding, Utah so uh, t try to uh, Make that if you can. It'd be a great place to learn. Okay? Let me uh, follow up with the chats and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, thank you for your patience, Andy. You're welcome, Ren Pixie. Um, yeah, hit the like button, somebody said. Why don't you do that? Hit the like button. I'd appreciate that. If you've sat here for an hour and a half, the least you can do is hit the like button. Um, everyone have a great week. Uh, the more popular you get, the longer your live shows will get. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm not complaining at all. Um, I appreciate all of my, um, you know, fans, subscribers, people that enjoy watching my stuff, and and I'm here to help. My job, you know, and people say, "What do you do?" And I, you could say, "Oh, I'm a YouTuber," but uh, I really tell people I, I teach pottery because that's really what I do. I just use YouTube as a, as a channel for teaching pottery. So um, I teach pottery, and and. There's no better way to teach pottery than to sit here and and answer you guys' questions. So uh, I I don't I don't lament it at all. I'm I'm tr I'm glad I could help. Remember corn grinder in the doobly doo, please. Yeah, I'm doing that, Liam. But hey, if you're in Ireland, I don't know if you can order off the same Amazon as me. But maybe that'll help. All right, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. I thank you all for coming with me, and I will.